Christoph, thank you for taking this time to be with us. Christoph has been the chief scientist, he is the chief scientist of MindScope program at the Allen Institute in Seattle. Uh, he was a professor of biology and engineering at Caltech for, was it 27 years, Christoph, now? Yes. 27 yep. years, moving to the Allen Institute where he became the chief scientist and then the president in 2015. Um, he's probably best known for his studies and writings exploring the brain uh, basis of consciousness or the neural correlates of consciousness. Um, his latest book, which I must admit I haven't yet read, I need to get a signed copy, then at least, uh, is the, the feeling of life itself, why consciousness is widespread but can't be computed. It's a beautiful title. Uh, Christoph spans all the spectrum of biology down from ion channels, biophysics, neurophysiology, interests going really wide brain machine interfaces conscious research but i think one of the most exciting things is that he's brought an industrial revolution to neuroscience um, which is really quite spectacular what they've accomplished at the allen institute um, and so today he's going to tell us a bit about modeling the human brain and the future perspectives whenever there is funding for such a plan Christoph, thank you. Up to thank you, you, Henry, for the introduction. Thank you for, for having me. Uh, so I, the views here are my own views on this uh, on the problem of modeling the human brain, although I'll primarily, the first part, I'll talk about the, the mouse brain because I wanted to show in order to model parts of the mouse brain, what does it take? And therefore then extrapolate from, from the mouse to the human, which is roughly a thousand times bigger. So um, at the Allen Institute, we focused on, on two species, human and, and mouse over the last 10 years. Um, talking about the mouse, we probably had 200 people, uh, scientists, staff, engineers, focus on mouse visual cortex. And what we built there, we built these brain observatories where we can record on a highly standardized and, and repeatable um, and condition. We can record activity uh, either using two photon calcium imaging or neural pixels. Um, and then together with all of our anatomy and connectivity data and EM data that I'll briefly talk about, we then attempt to, to model it in great, great detail at several levels of um, of granularity. Um, so in order to do this model and this modeling, that was one of the goals when I came, as Henry said, from Caltech to, to the Allen Institute in, in 2011, we initiated with Paul this 10-year uh, project, um, 10 years, uh, for roughly a billion dollar investment. And, and one of the um, goals was to make the best possible model at the cellular level of a piece of highly excitable matter, in this case, primary visual cortex. That's the one we focused on for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> so we set up these, um, um, these pipelines. So by pipelines, we mean a systematic set of procedures that takes in, let's say, in this case, a mouse brain or sometimes a human a piece of human brain, uh, a human tissue from neurosurgery. It's exactly the same procedure at one end, and out comes. Um, uh, a description of, of some neurobiological aspects. In this case, this pipeline here, we adopted the, the, the nomenclature that Henry introduced. We talk about M types, E types, T types, ME types and MET types, i.e. morphological electrical types. So here enter brain slices, either human or mouse. And then we, uh, we have a standard protocol that we do each and every day. We have eight, um, eight patch uh, uh, set up uh, eight rigs with staffed by, by highly trained um, um, RAs, technicians, and, and uh, where we do a standard protocol of electrophysiology, um, either in wild type mice or in cream mice, of course in human tissue, it's all wild type human tissue as it were, and we inject then biocytin in order to reconstruct them. So we have this, uh, this set of, of uh, 46 different morphoelectrical types that we've identified in, in the laboratory mouse. 
Um, we then we have this automatic pipeline whereby we we, we generate using supervised uh, uh, procedures that we got from Idan Segev's lab, where we automatically characterize. Uh, let me get here the. Um, Highlight here where we uh, uh, where we supply the morphology. Then here we assume that the uh, the soma and the axon is active and the dendrite is passive. It's a limitation, uh, and then uh, the black one is the experimental data, and then the red is the is the simulated data using a neuron that we derive in the semi supervised manner. We can do the same with the, we've done the same using exactly the same data from the same cells, but here uh, generating a variety of point models from very simple to standard leaky integrated. And fire to much more sophisticated uh, generalized leaky in, uh, integrated fire model. This um, we've also done together with Costas and the Blue Brain people. We've also done this with uh, active, uh, active dendrites. More recently, uh, we've taken a technique that was pioneered in, uh, in this paper, Toledo uh, Rodriguez, many years ago in, in Henry's lab, where we combined all three techniques, so-called patch-seek. So we go into individual cells, we suck out the nucleus, we find that's the most reliable way to characterize the single cell RNA transcriptomics. We, in, uh, we have a brief electrophysiological paradigm and we inject with biocytin and we, um, and we recover the cells. Um, so here we've done this in something like uh, 4,000, um, in this particular paper that just came out in 4,000 uh, interneurons, GABAergic interneurons in uh, mouse visual cortex. And there's an ongoing study to do something similar for, for, for the excitatory cells. And just looking at the inhibitory cells, trying to map the morph the, their morphology and of course the layer of origin onto the electrophysiology, onto their transcriptional cell type. For example, if we just stick with the with the somatos, uh, uh, somatostatin interneurons, you know, we find 13 different cell types. These, for instance, here are the charcoal cells. So these are the long range, the GABAergic interneurons that actually have long range axons, you know, the, the one exception to the rule that interneurons are always local. And, you know, we, we can go in depth into trying to characterize this. <clears throat> we have set up this, um, this pipeline using OctoRidge. Um, uh, Octopad, sort of similar to what uh, uh, Rodrigo Perrin uh, did already, you know, 10 or 12 years ago. And we've adapted that technology and we have a number of these bays. Here you can see the OctoRidge. It's all highly automated now with robots, et cetera, where we um, systematically, and this is uh, primarily in Cree and Cree type slices. We can also do this now in human using viral technology. It's really our, tech, our ability to manipulate human neurons has really in, increased greatly. Where we, where we systematically characterize here in, in this first paper, it's among excitatory cells, particular uh, superficial layer two, three, and layer four cells. Where we systematically characterize the, the synaptic connectivity among known Cree lines, i.e. among uh, known transcriptional uh, classes not subclasses, not the final leaves, but classes, uh, the strength and the kinetic of the dynamics, and then we characterize their, their short-term um, plasticity, all in a sort of semi-automated uh, way that we could do it consistently across all the neurons. Of course, since many, many years, we've, we, we've focused on the, on the connectivity. This is not only in V1, this is brain-wide, right? So, so um, about uh, uh, seven years ago, we published this brain atlas where we do this in, in wild-type mice, now roughly in 2000 wild-type and Cree, and Cree animals, where we inject you know, in one particular part of, let's say, neocortex or salamus or all these other parts, we inject... Um, uh, uh, fluorescent in a particular Cree line, and then we can we can we do tomography of the entire brain. It's this whole brain, uh, and then we can we can measure the strengths in a very systematic way. We can uh, measure the strengths of the synaptophysin, the the fluorescent signal in in the uh, in the presynaptic um, uh, 
throughout the brain. And we, we can, uh, here it's expressed in a, the, the weight, if you want, assuming that the, that the um, connectivity is proportional to this, uh, to the uh, uh, fluorescent signals here in a log scale, you can sort of see the brain wide connectivity. If you inject in this particular part of the brain, this is where on the, on the ipsilateral side and over here is on the contralateral side where the projections are. And you can deep mine this and there are many papers that have done this. And then here we used uh, um, uh, unsupervised machine learning to extract a hierarchy, to extract, a, uh, to extract out of all these uh, 2,000 plus mice and their whole brain connectivity, to extract our best estimate of a cortical thalamocortical uh, hierarchy. There is a hierarchy, it's pretty shallow compared to the monkey. So the hierarchy score here um, indicates the, you know, where the various um, thalamic, uh, uh, 34 thalamic area and 43 uh, cortical areas uh, are situated along this, uh, this hierarchy. All right, so that's the, uh, so this is how we extract the, the dynamics of the individual elements, the individual switching element, the neurons. This is how we learn something about their connectivity, both local in terms of their synapses, as well as across the brain. Uh, and now we combine that because it's really critical to not, uh, to not only reproduce the slice data. Of course, we need to reproduce the slice data, but really to reproduce the in vivo data. And so that's why we build, well, one of the reasons why we build these observatories and um, and so here you can see one of them. Uh, so here we have this mouse running. It's a head fixed mouse. It's running. Uh, I don't know why it's so slow. It's running past this natural movie. It's Touch of Evil. Uh, it's a particular Orson Welles movie. And here it's one particular uh, Cree line that lights up excite. It's a Cax2 line that lights up excitatory cells in. Uh, uh, in layer two, three, and we have multiple cameras so we can track the eyes and the body so we know uh, we can explain some of that variance due to the, um, to the motion of the animal. Uh, uh, we're building up or we have built up a totally separate pipeline where we use this uh, fantastic technology uh, uh, that was, um, we helped co-develop. It was really done under an uh, industrial consortium uh, involving members from UCL in London, in particular, Genelia, uh, Tim Harris at, um, at Genelia and us, where we take these pieces of machine silicon and we have um, uh, up to a thousand recording sites. And from each one, we can select 384 uh, and record from them um, both that uh, to, uh, each of these electrodes has two channels, both local field as well as action potential. And so in this pipeline, we can re routinely record from six, um, from six of these neural pixels, both uh, cortex as well as structures like colliculus, like the LGN and the lateral. Um, uh, so this is the equivalent of the pulvina, one of the, the visual salamic nucleus, as well as neurons down here in the brain stem. And again, we have this standard pipeline where we put in transcranic animals, we have surgery. For each animal, we do intrinsic imaging, so we know exactly where V1 is and where some of the other visual areas is. We habituate the animal, we do EFIS, and after every animal has done its thing, we, we, uh, uh, we sacrifice it and we recover exactly the, the trajectory of these, uh, of these neural pixel recording. So, and then we place everything in our three-dimensional coordinate system, CCF, so we know for every recording of every cell, whether it's in the slice or optical physiology, electric physiology, where it was, with a, with a um, 10 micron meter uh, pixel resolution. All right. So then, uh, under the leadership of these two, uh, um, um, these two investigators, Anton Akipov and Stefan Mihalas at this institute, we also build uh, this infrastructure to be able to model it. And we, uh, they built this, uh, this uh, brain modeling toolkit, BMTK, that allows you to, con to, to, and to build something. It's a sort of a software uh, suite for building models and performing simulation at multiple levels of resolution. So we focus either on the biophysical detailed multi-compartmental models or on, on these various point, um, point neurons. And we here we, we leverage the Sonata file format that we developed together with uh, the Blue Brain people. 
and then existing software such as you know Neuron and Nest. Um, and so it offers a consistent user experience uh, that allows you to build a model and then instantiate it and then simulate it using these existing simulators that like uh, Neon and NES. And of course, it's all open source um, uh, as a result, together with this um, Ensonata uh, flexible file format that we developed with you guys. And so here we now have this um, um, a model of visual cortex. I think it's probably the most accurate model right now of, uh, that reproduces in vivo data of, um, of a cortical area. It has visual input. In this case, we know that the majority, the bulk of the visual input comes directly from the eye through a switching staging in the thalamus called the LGN. We've recorded from the LGN. We know there are 14 different cell types. We've modeled them. And so now for arbitrary movies, for any movie um, that you that you want to use, we can simulate the, the, the barrage of spikes that come from the LGN and that project into the back of the brain into visual cortex. And so, of course, in particular, we use the movies that we get uh, that we that we show our mice, which is drifting gratings, st uh, flashing stating, local noise, uh, spontaneous activity, of course, natural scenes and natural movies. So the mice have seen this and now our model gets to see this too. And then, um, so uh, this was done by fantastic ex-Caltech uh, students, um, Yezan Billy under the leadership of Anton Akipov and Stefan Mihalas. So now we, we, we've built this model of uh, visual cortex. It's a little bit more than a cubic millimeter, but think of it like a cubic millimeter. A cubic millimeter is a very nice measure to think about. There are 500 cubic millimeters, so it's half a, um, uh, in a mouse brain that's half the size of a sugar cube. Sugar cube is roughly one by one by one centimeter. Mouse brain is half of that. One cubic millimeter is sort of one uh, five hundredths of a mouse brain. And in this sugar cube, um, you know, so uh, the exact number is a quarter of a million of 17 different cell classes. So mind you, these are not all the cell classes we have currently identified using the, the morphoelectric uh, uh, transcriptional description. It's still a smaller uh, um, set of classes. We have exactly the same model. It has ex the exact same connectivity here and here, but in one case, it's these very detailed biophysical models, including you know um, extended dendritic compartments. In the other case, it's a it's a variant of um, of leaky integrate in fire. <clears throat> And all of this you can uh, you can download. So now you, you uh, and I'm not going to go into the detail here. It's more the principle. So now we have of course. So we have the structure and the function of individual neurons that we get from slice recordings, uh, and we have the connectivity from our recordings, and so now and we have the in vivo data. So now we can try to map all of this together onto this onto the model, and using you know. At this point, a set of sort of um, human guided intuition, somewhat systematic, but ultimately human guided intuition, we adjust the various uh, parameters. We first provide only the, in, the feed forward LGN input and we try to reproduce a firing. And then we slowly add layer four feedback, then we add layer two, three uh, feedback uh, into the model in order to. to to learn to adjust the various parameters in order that we 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 can reproduce what we see experimentally. So it's sort of it's a intuitively guided developmental process, but it's it's totally dependent on intuition. I have to emphasize it's not as it's it's sort of a semi-systematic one, and I think this is a big problem that needs to be addressed. And so here you can see. Um, so these are the um, this is one particular sequence of um, of uh, of data in response to a grating and uh, a moving grating. Uh, here are uh, different neurons recorded using neural pixel in response to this particular grating. And here you can see the experimental data. And so we can now do, uh, and again, I'm not going, it's all in the, in, the, in, the, in the neuron paper. So here we now systematically compare for each of the different cell classes. So for example, for the excitatory cell in layer two, three, um, the regular spiking cells and the inhibitory cells, uh, both in the um, experimental data that's gray. So this is the whisker representation. 
where the 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 median is is uh, the red bar and then the the box is the 25 and 75 percentile and the whiskers are up to 1.5 uh, times of the interqu interquartile range we the gray shows you the experimental data the orange shows you the model using glyph point neurons and the red uh, uh, using the biophysical model Right. And so you can now do statistical tests. So, for example, you can ask, can you statistically using a chi-square, some, you know, some some statistical criteria, can you distinguish the, uh, uh, you know, when can you distinguish the model from the experimental data? Right. If I show you a, uh, an arbitrary set of these recordings, can you statistically reliable distinguish them from the from saying, well, this is simulation and this is a model. This is sort of the imitation game that that Michael uh, Bice and I talked about in the in the news the news that accompany, accompanied um, your big article, um, uh, Marka Med Al in Cell. Uh, you know the, the your beautiful work modeling the uh, somatosensory cortex. All right, and sometimes you can tell the difference, and sometimes you cannot tell the difference. Right. Um, you can also predict a new phenomena that we haven't uh, um, that we haven't trained the model on. So the model is sort of trained on trained in this way. So there's no way right now we can do unsupervised systematic learning in these highly highly nonlinear uh, uh, neural networks. So that's why I emphasize we really depend on human intuition. Yeah, let's first. Get the LGN to uh, the LGN input onto cortical cell right, and then let's get the layer four um, recurrent connection right, and then let's add the layer two three feedback because we think that's the best stable way to do it. There's no way this could be done right now in this heavily nonlinear feedback system in any um, in any semi uh, in any automatic uh, un uh, unsupervised way. Partly because of the sheer computational cost, it's quite expensive, of course. The biophysical model roughly runs 10,000 times slower than the point model, but even the point model, you know, on a single on a single uh, node, takes uh, many minutes to um, and to execute. But the point is, you can now sort of derive, you know, you can simulate uh, and then compare it against things that uh, that the model wasn't sort of uh, in this fashion trained on to try to see. For instance, for a looming stimulus, we haven't shown this even to our animals yet. We are planning to, but we haven't shown it. How do we expect the model to respond to to different type of, of natural movie that it hasn't seen or to different time of looming stimuli? And then uh, we also very, very, I've always been very interested in, uh, together with Michael Reimann um, and Henry, we published a neuron paper, I can't remember, six years ago, where we used the, the blue brain to simulate local fields. So we continue uh, to do that work because we have from these neural pixel recording, as I mentioned, there are two bands. Each electrode has both an action potential band and a local field band. And so we can measure the local field from the neural pixel data going down from, from the top of uh, V1 to the bottom. So this is the local field from, from the experiment measured every 20 micrometer. We now, by the way, have a new probe called Neural Pixel Ultra, where we can do the same thing, but now measuring every uh, five micron meter. They have a much higher uh, uh, density of, of recordings. And here we can compute the current source density. This is in response to a flash. So very powerful stimulus. You get a flash onset at zero, and roughly at 50 milliseconds later, you get this, uh, this particular pattern of sinks and sources. And here, you know, we're beginning to approximate it. This is not, this is not good, but it's 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 work in progress. This is done together with Gauti Einefall and Adler uh, Reimhog in uh, in Oslo. All right, so this is where we are. So I, I I do believe at least right now the landscape is currently is constantly changing, of course, and lots of people are doing modeling. But right now this is uh, sort of among the the most uh, accurate models of a piece of highly excitable matter in in cortex. <clears throat> now, 
and in principle, the claim of the model is, although this has to be tested, that it works for any arbitrary input. Now, of course, it's still relatively isolated. It's just V1. It doesn't have basal ganglia. It doesn't have arousing systems. You know, it doesn't have uh, all the other cortical areas. So it's a very, very, very primitive, very isolated version. Um, um, so as I said, we... Um, so this is uh, the, the, the mouse we work on. This is our co uh, common coordinate systems. So we have a very good, very high, re high resolution atlas of the, of the mouse brain. We know rough, this atlas has 46 cortical areas, you know, 46 on the left and 46 on the right, and 260 subcortical gray map. Oh, and this, by the way, this number then gets multiplied by five cortical layers. Layer one, layer two, three, four, five, and six. 260 subcortical areas. They're roughly, you know, we estimate on the order of 70 million neurons, and of which 14 million are in cortex. So we've simulated right now one tiny part, you know, here uh, of a quarter of a million. But the total animal, of course, is, is 71. And you know this very well because you've made a whole brain model of it. All right, so... Um, Last year, you published this beautiful paper, Michael Reimann, this beautiful paper with uh, Elif and Henry and, and others, that based on our mesoscopic connectivity atlas, and then together with the whole brain single neuron reconstruction from, uh, from uh, Janelia Mouse Light, sort of creates a, a zeroth order model of whole cortex, not whole mouse yet, but whole cortex. Uh, uh, assumption. And I think this is exactly the way to go. This is exactly the right way to go. But of course, it's based on many explicit and implicit assumptions. For instance, it's based on some version of, uh, of Jones rules that, you know, locally, once you get down to, let's say, layer three, that the, the connectivity is really proportional to to the uh, to the product of the of the of the of the pre and post synaptic densities. And I mean, it has to, you know, any such model has to be based on a number of explicit that you guys actually make explicit. It's very nice, this paper, because you have to, you list this table where you make these uh, eight or nine specific assumptions. They each have to be checked. Some are probably very good and others, uh, we can probably all agree are probably not so, uh, not so good. All right, so enter. The next level of resolution, if you believe that you really need all this resolution, ground zero. What's ground zero? Ground zero, many of us believe, is, um, is EM. So you probably know we have since seven years under Claire Reed and Nunu da Costa, who comes from, uh, from Zurich, we have this large scale connectivity project where we have now done this in two mice and one human uh, volume, so-called cubic millimeter where we've roughly taken a volume on the order of a cubic millimeter. It's actually a little bit less. Uh, first uh, funded by IARPA. This was uh, together with uh, Andreas Tolias and Bela and Sebastian Song, where the tissue was first uh, uh, exhaustively physiological characterized using two photons and then reconstructed using six different EM microscopes. Then we've done the same just in-house in V1 and then we've done the same in a little bit of human uh, medial temple um, gyrus. That work is proceeding. It's proceeding depending who you talk to, either very fast or very slow. The fact of the matter is that we do not yet have... So, so, so this uses modern machine learning techniques. Of, um, uh, partially supervised, there's human annotators in the loop, and there's, an, in fact, an entire industrial consortium that involves a company, Ariad, that farms this out to human annotators, and that human data is used to train machine al um, and machine uh, vision algorithms to do this automatically. And this can be done now, so there's one paper out on BioArchive, for this has been done for Sean Lay cells, layer two, three Sean Lay cells that make synapses onto layer two, three cells. By the time this is done for the entire cubic millimeter, which you know is on the order of 100,000 cells, a billion synapses, maybe with 90% accuracy or so, it'll be 2025. It's a big volume, it's two petabytes. I mean, just shipping it, you can't just ship it. You have to put it on a huge truck and ship it. Just accessing, building the infrastructure is a big, 
you know, two petabytes, a lot of data. So I estimate that this complete, that the, this first complete annotated cubic millimeter will be, a, will be fully there and accessible in five years. You know, maybe it gets fast, it's in four years, or maybe it's slow, it's in seven years. But I, but I, that's my personal estimate. Some of the people at my institute will beg to differ, but anyhow. So then people are thinking about trying to do this. There's some talk here in the US, uh, particularly involving the, uh, the national labs and the Department of Defense. We'll see wh whether it comes anything out of it. But to, to try to do this for the entire mouse. As I said, the mouse is you know, half the size of a sugar cube. So doing it for one cubic millimeter using six uh, EMs, uh, and then scaling that up by roughly if by three orders of magnitude, you know, it's probably going to take us at least another 10 years just doing the uh, connector. In other words, doing the high resolution imaging, um, you know, the, the cutting and slicing in, you know, uh, I think this one was 40 nanometers, if you believe that's a, a, the right level of resolution, just doing all that mechanics and storing all that data. We're now talking about a, a, a thousand uh, 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 petabytes. And then annotating that, you know, it's probably going to take us at least another, you know, between annotating a cubic millimeter and then annotating a thousand times bigger volume, we're probably at least talking another 10 years, assuming this will happen. This is going to be a big project. Just doing this, the mechanics of this, you know, we're talking about many hundred millions of dollars and maybe there's an appetite for it, maybe there isn't. That remains un unclear, but it's, it's certainly possible that we could have a complete mouse connectome by in 15 years from now. All right, so uh, you might all disagree with this and maybe we can have a debate afterwards. This is sort of my estimate what it takes to do a realistic whole mouse brain modeling. So I think the biggest challenge, the biggest intellectual challenge is even assuming we, we get this connectome, we have to have, because even this connectome only gets us part of the way, because of course we now have to make assumptions, something like the synaptic connectivity is proportional to the, to the thickness of the synaptic uh, profile that may or may, may not be true. We don't know anything about the dynamics. We have to make inference about short-term plasticity, short-term le uh, learning rules. Of course, we also have to make assumptions about long-term uh, learning rules, uh, et cetera. It will be absolutely critical and we see that in all our work, we need to develop non-super unsupervised whole brain learning rules. In other words, we need to be able to say, okay, this is the brain now. Um, here are all the neurons and here are some of the connection. Now we need some procedure whereby the model will wire itself up. The best way, of course, the most powerful way to do this if we could mimic developmental sequence. But then we also have to mimic the, 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 the dynamic change in connectivity that happens, which is even more daunting. So this, this is a, a big intellectual challenge, how to develop unsupervised learning rules to wire up. We, we, we have data that we can compare it against, right? We have the slice data, of course, that's very easy. Much more challenging, we have, all the, we have lots of in vivo data we can compare it against. But these are heavily, heavily nonlinear feedback system, very different from the deep convolutional network that the uh, AI community works on. So it's not clear how quickly are we going to get here. In particular, if we want a whole mouse brain, we need to work on a variety of Habian and, of course, non habian learning goals, right? There's adaptation everywhere, not just in the synapses. From if you really want to really model a whole mouse, we have to go to weeks at least, you know, if not lifetime, from milliseconds to weeks. So that's, you know, eight to nine orders of magnitude. Of course, that's not going to be just one rule, but many rules. As you guys have shown already, as I, you know, many years ago, um, Elif, I think, visited us and gave a talk and showed this video of this tap dancing mouse. This de develops, of, uh, will require, of course, the development of a whole body uh, and its umwelt to properly understand the sensory cognitive motor loops that the animal operates under. 
this must also be guided not just by uh, recordings in V1 or somatosensory or whatever your favorite area is, but in vivo cellular level, not fMRI or the equivalent, but really cellular level recordings in the context of sensory cognitive motor behavior. So something like the I, uh, like the International Brain Lab is, is pioneering now. Right, so you need whole brain recordings together with learning rules uh, in order to have um, in order to have a, a data set to understand, to generate a model and then ge and test it against uh, whole brain cellular level recordings. So I think the key problem is not so much the computational infrastructure. Yeah, you need roughly you know 300 times bigger infrastructure that than we needed right now for and for this V1 model. But the big problem is really constraining the degrees of freedom to reproduce experiments and predict new phenomena. We just have, you know, millions of degrees of freedom and the question constraining them, this I think where learning will, will be absolutely essential. Now, I believe <clears throat> this will not happen to 2040. Now, what I do not mean that of course there will be models over the next 10 years that'll say, look, and that will be published, look, here I have a whole brain mouse model. And it's true, we will be able to, to, under very limiting circumstances, reproduce some sort of, you know, simple statistics of firing, uh, you know, during, during some, during some uh, state, let's say, background resting state activity or epileptic seizure or something like that. But, I'm but that's just like saying, well, yeah, I can do a snapshot of the weather. What I mean by simulation is a simulation that predicts either precise numerical prediction, like in weather prediction, where, you know, we, we now know over the last 30 years, uh, for example, the mean distance between the expected landfall of a hurricane and the actual landfall has systematically dropped by factor of two every decade, or the, for a particular numerical cr criterion that you want to predict, weather prediction has increased by one day roughly per decade. We need precise criterion like that. And, and we really want a general purpose model that predicts sort of new phenomena, not just something isolated. That I simply, you know, and that can predict a whole, where one model can predict a whole range of different behaviors, visual behaviors, some other sensory behaviors, cognitive behaviors, over a variety of time scale. That isn't going to happen in the next 20 years. Now, if you think that's pessimistic, uh, note that we still, this is, this, this continues to amaze me, okay? We still do not have a general purpose model of C. elegans. We have the complete connectome for, of several animals since 1986, right? The famous paper by White, The Mind of a Worm. You know, so that's 25 years. Since a quarter of a century, we have the connectome. This creature only has 302 neurons, not 302,000 neurons, but 302 neurons, that's it. And there's no general purpose model that tells you for an arbitrary chemical input or an arbitrary sensory input, uh, you know, under, uh, under sort of some particular task, this is what the animal will do. Nor do we have a model, to my intense fr frustration, okay, so let's forget about these funny creatures like C. elegans, right? Let, let's take the mammalian retina, the simplest piece of human, of tissue in the human brain is the retina. It's entirely, it's a to very good uh, approximation, it's first order. We know it precisely its input, it's a stream of photons. We know precisely its output, it's a pattern of action potential. And there's no general purpose model right now that takes an arbitrary spatial, temporal, spectral input and will predict what the retina will do. Okay, so that's why people, uh, people routinely underestimate how, you know, the, the great cost in, in making these things happen. Anyhow. All right, so now let's jump to from the mouse. This is a picture a National Geographer uh, a a photogra photographer took at our institute. So this is the mouse brain, and this is the human brain. They're almost exactly a factor of thousand. So, you know, it's 1,400 gram versus half a gram. Okay, so it's 2,800. 86 billion versus 71 million, 16 billion versus 14 million. So call it three orders of magnitude. Both are highly refined products of natural selection. We always have to call this to mind. It's not true that we are a more advanced version of, of the mouse, right? We are both terminal, we are both terminal branches on the current evolutionary tree. 
I know that many of you, I know uh, Idan and, and others, many of you believe that the that the neural complexity of the human is much high, is higher than the mouth. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I know all of us have a very strong belief in human exceptionalism. It's very deep seated, and we use all sorts of metrics, you know, to make sure that when we construct scales, allometric scales, you know, that humans come on top because we believe we are the the obviously the most advanced species. And so there's a very strong confirmation bias here, right? Because everybody keeps on looking for things that make that make us special. And so only focuses on those things where by some metric, you know, we come out ahead. Personally, I'm somewhat skeptical of that. The biggest difference that people routinely underestimate is this. We have a thousandfold larger nervous system. You know, so if you look at computers and you look at, you know, computers differ in their performance, just think of having a computer that's thousandfold, um, you know, bigger than another computer and the difference in function. So I think this is by far the biggest. There are, of course, all sorts of, of small differences. I'm not... The human brain is not the same as a, as a mouse brain, although it's 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 similar. But I'm I'm not sure there's any one single difference that that says, oh, that's why human is the dominant species. That's why there's eight billion of us. All right. Now, of course, as you um, um, as you know, this is sort of a technique based, uh, pioneered by Gabor Tamas at University of Sigedev in Hungary. And this is part of a, of a paper that, that comes from the Allen Institute together with uh, Christian de Kork and his group with Hype Mansfelder and of course with, um, with, with Idan, where we characterize in neurosurgical tissue, we're beginning to characterize human neurons. And I know the at this workshop you're you're talking about this. So here, for example, you know uh, uh, um, this paper on bioarchive here focuses on supragranular uh, pyramidal cells doing this MET uh, um, characterization. So here there are these five different transcriptional defined cell types that uh, have a particular morphology that changes very systematically and a particular type of, of, um, of electrophysiology. This is all fantastic work. I love it. I'm very proud to be part of this collaboration. I think it's, it's very powerful. But we're here at the stage uh, where we were with mice, you know, a number of years ago. <laughs> but it's cool stuff. Now, what we don't have and what we'll only have extremely limited access over the next decade is in vivo cellular level data. So this is data from a paper I published with, an, uh, uh, with a surgeon, uh, Itzhak Fried, uh, Quiran Quiroga was a postdoc at the time in my lab, the so-called Jennifer Anson neuron, right? So we, and there are many, many papers now published on this where uh, in a patient, in a clinical ward, you know, they have to be implanted with electrode. It's like feet added these, um, these uh, tiny wire electrode where you can do single unit recording. And here, you know, we find these neurons and there are many of them in the, in the higher part. This is in the, um, in the uh, left parahippocampal uh, region where you find units that respond to, in this case, famous people like, like an actress. We have almost except under this very limited window where for a couple of hours you can record typically almost always in the middle temple lobe in patients you can record in vivo data right now there's no technique that allows us to do widespread recording in the human brain and so this data is entirely missing that is a big 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 uh, issue any model needs to deal with and so here, my here's sort of what what just to finish off what I'd like to say about a realistic whole brain human modeling. Once again, I think it's going to be absolutely essential. We can't just do this based on our intuition that we have some wiring diagram and we think, well, I think I need to increase this by factor two here and over there. I adjust it by twenty percent. This is not going to happen. Not in a brain that's a thousand times bigger than a, a, a mouse when we haven't even done, you know, when it's been challenging enough to do it in a piece of brain tissue that's a thousand times less than the entire um, uh, mouse brain. So this, of course, requires rules that go from milliseconds to years, so nine to ten orders of magnitude. Just like the mouse, it depends on a whole body model of human. We need an... Right now, it's difficult to imagine 
non-invasive technology. So there is a version of NeuralPixel, you probably know that has been developed for primates. Uh, I'm part of an effort that tries to develop these neural pixels for neurosurgery to put them into human. That's probably going to happen over the, over the next two years. But again, that's going to be very limited recording for an hour, maybe before the surgeon, you know, you put in a neural pixel probe in a part of the uh, human brain with the permission of the patient, of course, where the neurosurgeon knows that he has to remove that, you know, half an hour later. Um, and uh, same thing with Neuralink. It's fantastic technology but it's highly, highly invasive. And so will we get new cellular recording technologies at the cellular level that are um, massive parallel, probably invasive? Of course, ultimately, we really want non-invasive. We really need radical new computational infrastructure because, you know, out of magnitude, it's roughly a, mil a million times bigger than this uh, mouse visual cortex uh, simulation that I, I told you about. Um, how do we constrain the million-fold larger degrees of freedom? That's really the big... Uh, the, this is a technology problem. This is really uh, a conceptual problem. Yeah, and then once again, so in, in the sense of not just having a one-off, you know, somebody from IBM doing a one-off to get the, you know, the Cray Prize, a one-off simulation of something that has 86 billion neurons, just so you can say I've simulated the human brain, but to do a general purpose, predictive, whole brain, cellular level emulation of the human brain. Unfortunately, I am unlikely. I'm now, I now turned a million years in binary code. I am probably unlikely to experience this, sadly, unfortunately. However, I do remain in the long term, I remain very optimistic in the long term. And I, I just came across this. I was rereading this fantastic book. It's a very thin little book, 100 pages. I can warmly recommend it by a crystallographer, an Irish crystallographer who worked in Cambridge, at Bernal, The World, the Flesh, and the Devil. He has this fantastic, so he talks about the long-term future of uh, human and, and the human brain, among others. And he has this uh, fantastic vision of uh, what, what will happen to Homo sapiens in the long term. Are you talking here about a, a, a thousand years? Just a nice inspirational uh, quote. And with that, I thank our founder, uh, Paul Allen, who made uh, all of this work that I told you about possible. And I uh, this is our team. Everything we do is you know, done by a very large team of uh, highly motivated researchers, engineers, technicians, scientists, uh, software people, et cetera. And with that, I thank you for your attention.